All right, well, welcome back to the Alaska Sea Life Center for another telepresence or uh, teleaquarium, as we're calling it, where we're bringing the Alaska Sea Life Center to you, right? So you can't come visit us right now. You might be locked up at home, but we want to make sure that you know all about the cool animals that we have here at the Sea Life Center, but also just around Alaska, our marine animals. Uh, so right behind me, of course, when people come visit the Sea Life Center, they walk around, they make their way to this hall, they see our salmon shark painted on the wall. Uh, we've actually got one hanging from the ceiling elsewhere in the building, and they always ask, where are your sharks? So we don't actually have the sharks here at the Sea Life Center right now, but Alaska does have sharks in our waters. Uh, and if you tuned in last week for this program, you actually learned a bit about our sleeper shark research, looking at the Pacific sleeper shark. Uh, and Dr. Amy Bishop kind of gives an intro, a little bit of a tease on that program, because I think we ended right as they were starting to catch the shark. So this week we want to talk about uh, that Pacific sleeper shark research and listen to Dr. Amy Bishop once again as she actually walks us through what we did once we got a shark. So we're just going to hand it right on over to her. All right, thanks everybody for tuning in again. Hopefully uh, this is you tuning into the second episode of the sleeper shark research that we've done here at the Sea Life Center, as Alex said. Um, if you haven't though, I'll show you the link in just a minute and make sure that you go back and check out the story that we posted last week. because it really tells you a lot about how we got interested in this species of shark. Um, before I go too much further today though, I do wanna make sure that I recognize that this is a hugely collaborative project between the Alaska Sea Life Center and our collaborators at California State University Long Beach in the Shark Lab. And that the project was funded through a uh, grant from the North Pacific Research Board. So with that, we'll jump right back in uh, to do a quick recap. Like I said, if you wanna watch the whole video, this is where you can uh, find it on our Sea Life Center YouTube channel check it out. But to do a really brief overview of why we're interested in Pacific sleeper sharks, there's kind of three facets about them that really got us interested in developing a research program. First of all, they are a top predator. So some of our research at the Safe Center actually led us to find that they may be a primary predator for the endangered stellar sea lions in Alaska. So with us knowing that they are predating on stellar sea lions, as well as other fish species, they probably play a pretty key role in the ecosystem. However, we really don't know a lot about them. We don't even know what their population size is in Alaska. So not knowing that component of an ecosystem makes it really tricky to be able to kind of understand and manage that ecosystem or model how that ecosystem might respond to future changes like climate change. Another perspective, is that sleeper sharks are an important species in terms of our fisheries resources in Alaska. They aren't particularly caught for food. They're not very tasty. And in fact, they have kind of a, a, a noxious, toxic kind of substance in their bodies that makes it really hard to eat them. But they are occasionally caught as bycatch by these fishing operations. So that means that it's incidental catch. They weren't trying to catch the sharks, but they get caught on the hooks anyway. And so that represents a cost to those fisheries. And again, we're removing animals from the ecosystem and we don't necessarily know what impact that might be having on everything else. The last reason why we're interested in sleeper sharks is that they're just basically a really cool animal from what we do know. And what we do know mostly comes from their closely related species, the Greenland shark. And this was the cover of Science Magazine a couple years ago where researchers for Greenland sharks found that those animals probably live somewhere between 200 and 500 years old. That's really, really something that is unique. They might be the oldest living vertebrates on the planet at this time. And so just wondering, because sleeper sharks are so closely related to Greenland sharks, what is it about their biology and their physiology that enables them to live that long? How do they live as deep as they do in the ocean? How, how do they do everything that they do really gets us to kind of that basic scientific questions that get us excited and get us interested in doing these types of projects. So as Alex said last week, we had talked about the background of the project, why we were interested in sleeper sharks, and started to walk through some of the process of how we went about fishing for sleeper sharks in Resurrection Bay right here in Seward. So to pick up where we left off, this is a video of us coming up to one of our buoys. These buoys, again, were set for about six hours with, in the water with the hooks, and we'd come up to them in the afternoon to recover them and see what we caught. So we'd haul 
all the gear onto the ship. That's Taylor, our graduate student from Cal State Long Beach, and myself grabbing the gear. And then we hook that all up to a hand pulley system where we would be pulling in by hand anywhere from 600 to about 900 feet of line that may or may not have a very large shark on the bottom of it. So it was kind of a slow, monotonous process. You would sit there and you'd be coiling and coiling and coiling. And then, whoops, uh, eventually you might actually have payoff at the end of it. So this was where we left off last week. We were pulling and everything was really heavy and we finally caught our first shark in 2018. And this was our lead PI, Marcus Horning's response to that momentous event. Dr. Horning, how do you feel? Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? The fishy, fishy, fishy worked. <laughs> <laughs> Setting the um, so that really was a momentous event. As I mentioned last week, we had been fishing for about two months. We changed our gear types. We'd been out in absolutely awful weather and some nice days as well. And we hadn't had any luck catching anything. Um, so the first time we were actually able to see this species up close, it really was exciting. And we were sending emails to our collaborators that weren't with us that summer. And it really was just this opportunity for all of us to, to really get excited and finally get hands on uh, look at the animals. Now, before I go too much further, I wanted to briefly talk about the size range of the animals that we were looking for for this study. So like I said, there's a lot of different reasons why we're interested in sleeper sharks. And the main purpose of the study was to actually catch rather small animals. So in the range of two to two and a half meters or about six to seven feet sized animals. And we actually wanted to bring those animals back to the Sea Life Center for a temporary amount of time. So we would keep them in a place where we could have controlled access to these animals so we could actually start to learn a little bit more about their physiology and biology that we wouldn't be able to do if we only worked with them in the wild. This system has worked really well for other species where they can come in, be monitored by our expert uh, husbandry and veterinary teams, participate in some of the research questions that we have, and then be re-released back into the wild after a short period. However, we knew that there, owned, there aren't only small sharks out there in Resurrection Bay. So for any of the animals we caught that were a little bigger, on average, uh, three to four meters, so more like nine to 13 feet, those animals we did have a plan to process in the field. So we could still use those animals to learn more about the species as a whole. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Now, what we were hoping that we wouldn't catch, because I think it might have actually been slightly bigger than our boat, are the really, really, really big, really old animals. And so these animals can actually max out in the 20 to 27 foot range. Um, so we were hoping for anything from kind of that small to average range as part of our study. So in 2018, we caught a total of nine sharks. Um, there's only seven of them shown here that we got really good photos for. And we basically learned that we need a bigger boat. We didn't catch any in that small uh, size class that we were hoping that we could actually bring back to the center. Now it's still great though, because we were able, like I said, to learn a lot about them and to get some other information about this species. So this video that I'm gonna play for you here kind of walks through what happens when we would catch one of these larger sharks in the field. So again, here we are hauling up the line uh, we're doing it by hand at this point because we know that we're close to the hook. So we're pulling it up slowly and you might see the hook just start to come above the surface of the water and the sharks start to emerge from the depth. We then start positioning ropes and webbing on the sharks so that we can better handle the animal, keeping it safe and us safe while we do all of the rest of our processing. Here you can see I'm checking the pelvic fins. That's one way that we can sex these sharks. So you can see here, if there's claspers present, it's a male. If there aren't, it's a female. Our shark this time was a female. And this position also allowed us access to the animal so we could take some biological samples like skin samples for genetic work or maybe muscle samples to better understand some of its uh, swimming physiology. We then also would attach tags to the animals both satellite tags to track its movement and these small orange and pink spaghetti tags that you see here. Those are individual identifying tags that have a unique number and let us know if we re-catch the same shark or if any other fishermen in the area happen to catch our shark, they might be able to let us know. Another key thing that we were trying to get from these sharks was a blood sample. 
blood samples are really helpful for when you're getting baseline information on a species you don't know a lot about because it gives you that basic health parameters that you know blood panel that you might get when you go to the doctor just to understand what your overall health is so we can compare both across animals across times of year or potentially to see if there were any impacts of our research on these animals so once we were done with all of our samples we then would remove the webbing and any of the ropes we had on the shark with one last check the shark was then able to swim off Here's a nice underwater shot with a GoPro of the shark heading back down to the depths. Those nice spaghetti tags shown there again. And the work wasn't done when the shark was gone all the time. Some of our samples needed to be processed in the field. So in particular, there was a blood parameter that we needed that needed to be processed relatively quickly. And depending on if we had other buoys to check, or just the transit time to get back to the Sea Life Center, it really meant that we had to do some of that work actually in the field on the rocking moving boat, as you see here. But all said and done, we would pack up and head home after a successful day. After the 2018 shark season, we rallied back together. We got our colleagues up for the 2019 summer and we were ready to hit the ground running and the first three sharks that we caught were all too big once again. <laughs> but not to be deterred, we continued fishing until one day in July, Taylor started hauling up the gear and called out to the rest of us on the boat, it's a shark, it is a very small shark. And so we all immediately got really excited because finally we had caught one of the sharks that was the right size for us to be able to understand this other component of their biology that we really needed to do at the Sea Life Center. The way that we move a shark from the wild to the Sea Life Center is that we would put the shark in a sling that contains water. So we're trying to minimize the amount of time that the shark is outside of the water. And we transferred it into what you see here, which we were calling the tech, a transport experimental chamber. It looks like a big bathtub. A couple other people called it or coined the term sharkophagus. But basically, it was this great uh, way that we could make sure that the shark had minimal exposure outside of the water. It was constantly monitored. Um, this is us moving the boat back to the harbor. So once the shark was aboard, we could motor ourselves slowly back to the harbor. We could monitor the water conditions the whole time, monitor the shark's conditions, and then bring it back to the center while still on the boat and in the tech. And the position of the center in Seward really helps facilitate that because you can see in the back of this picture, we're really right on the water. So when we were catching sharks just across the bay, it was a relatively short amount of time that it took for us once we got the shark out of the water and into the tech to bring it all the way back to the Sea Life Center, um, which is really great. If we were working somewhere a bit further afield, then that amount of time that the shark was on board would have been a lot longer. So when we got to the center, uh, we put the shark in one of our biggest, our ac actually our biggest pool. While I was at the center, we also developed a pool cover for this space because these are very deep dwelling animals. We wanted to make sure that they had that option of a darker, deeper part of the pool that they could choose to stay in. And this was a picture taken a couple days later as the shark was just making its laps. Now it was actually time for science. We had gotten the shark to the Sea Life Center and it was time to actually start investigating those questions that we really needed that controlled access component to answer. And so to best describe this, I'm gonna play this video that was made in-house, uh, here we go. 
through our respirometry runs, we're trying to estimate the metabolism of the Pacific sleeper shark. So we're trying to see how low of a metabolism it has because they're really closely related to the Greenland shark, which was recently found to live between 272 and 512 years. And we think that because it's so closely related to that species that it has a similar longevity, so with looking at the metabolism, we think that a really low metabolism could be why they're able to live for so long. We have this tank, it's like a bathtub with a lid on it. We put the shark in, we keep it in for some time, and we measure the oxygen consumption rate of the shark. It's kind of the equivalent of putting a shark on a treadmill, uh, which you would do with a human athlete or even with other animals that you study, except we can't put a shark on a treadmill. Instead, we put it into this tank uh, where water is circulated and where we measure oxygen decline. So a respirometer is our equivalent of a treadmill for a shark. So through that, we can look at maybe how often they need to eat and a lot of different things about their physiology that could help us learn a lot more about this species. So like they said, those respirometry experiments that we did, we did on the sharks while they were at the center. This is kind of that view of us collecting data on a, again, less than sunny day. Uh, Taylor was quite the champ. She would stay out for, you know, those trials were running for 24 hours. So she would be out there for a really long period of time overnight and with a great uh, collection of volunteers from the center and the community that also helped collect that data. While the shark was in the tech, um, we did have infrared cameras to be able to monitor it. There were some portholes that you can see kind of some black tarpaulin uh, put over so that it remained dark unless we needed to check on the shark. But we also, to make sure that there was some data in this diving into data presentation, uh, we did have accelerometers attached to the sharks. So that afterwards we would actually get an idea of how much the shark was moving when it was in that space. So here the red bars are when the shark was being more active, perhaps swimming slowly back and forth, moving its tail. And then the blue bars are those periods of kind of rest or inactivity. And that was really important to identify both for the shark's condition, but also afterwards, we could then process the metabolic data that we got and understand if we were looking at kind of a standard metabolic rate or a resting metabolic rate. So then once we were done experimenting both of the sharks, we brought two in in 2019. Uh, they stayed at the center for about two weeks each, and then it was time to release them back into the wild. question is obviously what have we learned so far? Uh, we did have, like I said, two animals that we were able to get metabolic measurements from at the Sea Life Center, and then we had a total of 23 sharks that we handled all together. So that's including the ones that we handled in the field. Um, much of the data that we're still working on, we're analyzing. So Taylor's hard at work working on that metabolic data and some samples from the muscle and the blood samples that we got to understand more about the shark's physiology and health as part of her graduate program. And then one of the things that we're working on is where those sharks went after we released them. Again, this is a picture of one of those tags. And this map shows you where we released all of those sharks. And the tags are programmed to stay with the sharks for anywhere from three months to six months, and then pop up and show us their location. So if you want to know more about that, you got to tune in next week. The saga continues. There's so much data and so much to talk about with sharks that we are going to continue this into a third week. And next week, we'll actually broaden it back out again and talk in general about how we monitor animals and their movements when they're out at sea. So I hope that you're all able to tune into that. Um, I hope that you learned a little bit about sleeper sharks, how we went about uh, working with sharks in the wild, 
what it was really important and why it was important for us to be able to work with them under that controlled access because it really adds additional information about the species that's going to be really important for understanding those bigger picture questions that we kind of let off with what their role is in the ecosystem. Um, again, these are all of the permits and our funders that I'd like to thank as facilitating and helping us make sure that this project happened. And I don't know if there's any questions online, but I'll give it back to Alex. So when I went out on the boat, I was able to see that shark that we saw the footage of get processed. Um, and I, I guess I was curious, with all the sharks that we brought in, uh, are they all kind of the same as far as activity? Because they're, they're sleeper sharks, they're known as being pretty lethargic. Um, and part of what we're researching is uh, how are they even catching sea lions, you know, to begin yeah. with. Um, <laughs> so were they all that way, uh, kind of slow, or did you ever see any, any burst to action out of these sharks? No, that's a great question. Um, so my prior experience with, you know, wild animals is usually animals that when you're trying to handle them or work with them, uh, that either need to be sedated for everyone's safety, or they're quite rambunctious and, and you know, they're trying to, to actively evade um, being handled. With these animals, the, the most that we saw in the wild was kind of that rolling behavior that you saw, and we kept the, the webbing and some of the um, ropes that we had to use with the shark fairly loose so that the animal had that flexibility to roll and reposition itself, but wasn't necessarily able to, you know, bang itself on the side of the boat or something like that. Um, but that was really the bulk of it. We didn't see any thrashing. And then for the sharks that were at the center, there were a couple of clips there of us in the pool with the water levels dropped so that we could access the animal and help kind of maneuver it over into the tech for those experimental uh, components. And we had herding boards, so these plastic boards in front of ourselves to keep us safe from the bitey end. Um, but largely the animals, again, didn't show any burst of speed, any kind of fast moving anything ever. <laughs> um, so it is still a little bit of a mystery how they might be able to catch a live swimming stellar sea lion. I think it's just fascinating thinking about these, uh, these large sharks, like you said, you know, uh, up, up to close 20 feet or more. Uh, just kind of mm -hmm. cruising around down there, and, and who knows, you know. Uh, but excellent. Well, we got a little bit more of a tease for next week, uh, so hopefully everyone can tune in for that. And you can tune in every day to our YouTube channel. We're doing two of these programs a day, not always looking into the data, uh, but we're exploring exhibits. Uh, we had a fun one a while back where we actually got to go visit one of our octopus here at the Sea Life Center, uh, and we were able to... Uh, visit that animal up close. So if you're interested in those sorts of programs, be sure you tune in every day at noon and two Alaska time, uh, or one and three Pacific time, uh, or what it would be, four and six uh, on Eastern coast. Um, but hopefully we'll see you all there, and we'll see Amy next week uh, for a couple more programs uh, looking into the data at the Sea Life Center. So thank you so much. Great, thanks.